So hear now the very word of God as it is given to us in the Gospel of Luke, reading from the 12th chapter. Now, we're going to go ahead and read verses 41 through 46, except this morning I had to split this. We're going to have part one and part two of this particular sermon. Uh, And so we're only going to focus on 41 through 44 this morning, but let me go ahead and read all of it so that it puts the idea of two servants and the distinction between them and to its perspective. Hear now God's word as it is given to us in this gospel of Luke. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is the servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and in an hour he does not know And will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. May the Lord bring understanding and clarity to this great passage this morning. Let's pray to him and ask for just that. Father, the words sometimes that Jesus spoke when he was here go through us like a knife. They're difficult. They're very harsh. And I know that these are among those words. We're not going to deal with the harshness this morning, but instead the good side of this comparison of the two servants. But I pray that in the back of our minds, we are keeping uh, the, the understanding that this is indeed a comparison between the kind of servants that you want us to be and the kind of servants that you do not want us to be. And if there's anything that we take home with us, dear Lord... It is just that fact that you have called us to be servants. And we ask it in Jesus' name, the greatest servant of all. May he be blessed by what we have to say in his name. Amen. Um, As we return to our study of Luke, uh, we kind of took a break over the Christmas holidays and looked at some other things. But actually, it's, it's exactly what we celebrate in the Christmas holidays that's going to be sort of the focus of our of our study now, because when we celebrate Jesus' birth, we are actually celebrating the coming of the Master. And I know it's hard for us to see it because we see baby in a manger and it's all wrapped up in that. But basically, when Jesus came to earth, and we've talked about this all through this part of Luke as the cosmic initiative, when the second member of the Godhead humiliated himself by taking on human flesh, setting aside his glory in that sense, and becoming human and walking in our midst, he came with the message of heaven, a message that probably is most succinctly stated by Mark at the beginning of his gospel when he says, this, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, when we look at this coming of Christ the first time, and we, we sort of look at it in human terms, anthropomorphically, if you'd like to talk about big words, but to, to put it in a human context, when Jesus left heaven, he left a place where everyone does the will of God. There's no rebellion. Satan and his minions are long gone. And so everyone in heaven does the will of God, and he comes down here into this sewer that we live in, And people don't do the will of God. Not only do they not do the will of God, they make it look like they are following God. They're the the consummate hypocrites. And so we find Jesus' most harsh statements, not against the pagan world, not, not, not against those that are completely lost in darkness, but those in the religious world, those that are in Judaism at the time, and that just is going to flow into the church in our time. 
But I want you to remember something as we go through this text. That this is not a distinction. And again, we're only going to look at the good servant this morning. Next week we will look at the wicked servant. But this is not a distinction between the church and the pagan world. These are within the church. This is within Judaism. This is the, the, all people who are supposed to be the people of God. That this very vital distinction is being made. And with that said, let's kind of take a look uh, before we get into this particular part, 41 through 44. It, it, it is kind of uh, the extension of, of the parable that went before it. it that, those thoughts just flow into this one. In fact, that sort of transitional statement that Peter makes, he is talking about the parable that we just studied. Now, if we were going right through this, that would have been last week. It's been a couple of weeks. So let me remind you of the parable that Jesus has just taught that is going to have a very strong bearing on what we see this morning. He, he, he talked about a master who left and left his estate uh, uh, to go to a wedding feast. And the reason that he chose a wedding, or the reason Jesus chose a wedding feast, was because they were of indeterminate length. You never knew how long they were going to last. It might have been two days, it might have been a week. Basically, it depended on the fortitude of the revelers and whether the wine and food held out. So the basics of that is that when the master leaves to go to a wedding feast... The servants back at home don't know when he's going to return. So he, he, he sort of sketches out for us uh, the same kind of servant that he's going to be talking about in the text this morning. This is a servant who is, first of all, ever ready. And we talked about having his loins girded, you know, having his robe tucked up so he could run and do ministry if he needed to when the master came back. And he had a lamp that was already lit, not just kind of standing by there, was lit so that when the master came, he could immediately serve him as he should. He was also a servant who would be ever awake. I mean, you could be ready, you could have your lamp lit and be fast asleep, but that's not, no, it, it is to be wide awake, conscious, uh, thinking of the things that your master might need when he returns. And then we saw that Jesus included sort of a parable within a parable. He talked about a householder, not the same master, but a householder who knew that a thief was going to burrow into his house and try to steal his goods and how ridiculous it would be to either go to sleep, get drunk, or go someplace knowing that this thief is going to come. You don't know when, but you know it's going to happen. And so that added the idea of ever watchfulness to this servant that he is describing. In other words, he's dressed, he's got his lamp lit, he's wide awake, but he's not inside the doors of the house reading a book or something. He's outside straining his ears, straining his eyes for the first sign or sound that his master was returning. Because he is a servant at heart. He wants to serve his master. He loves his master and is anticipating the return of that master. Now, the most dramatic part of that parable was what happened when the master returned. And it is one of the most significant parts as far as we are concerned. When the master returned and he found his servant ever ready, awake, and ever watchful, he put on the dress of a servant himself. And he had the servants sit down and he served them, which is totally upside down as far as the, 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 the life structure would be at that time. But it taught us something hugely significant. It taught us, first of all, that Jesus came as a servant. And brothers and sisters, if there's only one thing you remember today, please remember this. When the God of the universe, that God we sang about when we said, how great thou art, that God who is omnipotent and eternal and made the universe with a simple word, a thought in his mind, that God, when he revealed himself to us in human form, came as a servant. Don't forget that. That's huge. That is something that the church has completely forgotten and stuck into the back and doesn't pay attention to. When God came... He came as a servant. And that picture of 
the, ser- the, the master serving the servants, that's exemplary. Th- that's, that's what he wants out of us. He wants the servants to be looking after the servants. And that is very much what this particular passage is going to be about. And so with that said, let's continue the idea of servanthood and how significant it is to the kingdom of God. Look in verse 41. Peter asks a question uh, after that particular parable. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? Now, that's pretty straightforward. Um, he, Peter wants to know, are you telling this parable, the parable about the return of the master and being ready for that return? And when the master comes back, he blesses in an amazing way those who were prepared for his coming. Are you talking about us, meaning um, the disciples, not just the 12, I think, but a larger group of disciples, or are you talking about all? Now, I I just can't see Peter at this point in his life meaning all in the sense of every human being. In other words, he's still solidly Jewish. He's still, it's not going to be until Cornelius uh, later on that, that he's going to start to recognize that God has expanded the kingdom of God to include the Gentiles. You may remember the, the, the problem in the, the Galatian controversy. Peter was siding more with the Judaizers than he was with the Gentiles. So I just can't see Peter saying, well, this is, this is all you know, between the church and the world, in other words. No, this is between the close followers of Jesus and the rest of the Jews, the rest of Judaism. Now, th- this is one of those statements, even though it seems pretty straightforward. This is one of those statements that should kind of pop out at you, and you should be asking questions. Because if you were to go over to Matthew, you would find that the perspective around it is different. But if you go to Matthew, you would find that verses 42 through 46 are almost word for word identical. So in other words, either they use the same source or Luke borrowed it from Matthew or whatever. You don't get that close uh, without there being some uh, association there. But Matthew doesn't include this this question by Peter. So that means Luke inserted it. Luke thought it important enough to insert. And, And so you should ask yourself, well, why? Why was he doing that? Well, the reason, we're only going to get half the reason this morning. The actual, the answer is down in verse 48, which we may get to next week and we may not. But anyway, the, 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 the answer is, is that there's, there's, there's two different servants here. One is going to be rewarded. The other one is going to suffer horrible punishment. But they're all within what we would normally call the people of God. They're all within the covenant of God. They're all within the church. In other words, this is the, the wheat and the weeds that, that there has been infiltrated by people who really don't belong to be in the church. And many of them are actually in leadership. So that's why Peter's question is so significant. It really brings it down that, that this is really going to be the, within the church that we're talking about this distinction. So after Peter answers that question or asks that question, notice the way that Jesus answers it. Look in verse 42. And the Lord said, now let's just kind of hold it there. Because when Peter addresses Jesus in the previous verse, and when Luke talks about Jesus' reply, in both of those he's referred to as Lord, which many of you know, usually the underlying Greek word is the word kurios. And when you use the word kurios in this context about Jesus, you're talking about the second member of the Godhead incarnate in human flesh. And the fact that he is coming again is the backdrop, the wrapping of both of these parables. Look in the previous verse, the, before we get to ours, verse 40, and you'll see what I'm talking about. A, uh, Jesus there says, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. So without question, Jesus is talking about the second coming. And so that's important. That's all about this is being ready. The eschatology of the New Testament is being ready when Jesus returns. So that's sort of the backdrop. I still think that servanthood is the primary message 
and I'll try to bring that out as we go along. But anyway, notice the way that Jesus responds to Peter. Verse 42, and the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager? Brothers and sisters, please don't miss these things. Don't miss the way Jesus frames this response. Don't take it out of context. Peter asks Jesus a question. And he says, Lord, who is this great parable that you just taught for? The parable that talks about the master returning and the servants being ready and you blessing them amazingly. Who's it for? Us alone or for all of God's people, all of the Jews? And Jesus says, well, I don't know, Peter, who among you is a servant? Don't miss that. That is huge, folks. Which one? It doesn't matter whether you're a leader, whether you're an apostle, whether you're a disciple, whether you're in the pulpit, or whether you're in the pew. The question is, which one of you, who among you, is the faithful and wise servant? Jesus is teaching us the importance of servanthood. He is teaching us the importance of being a servant in the kingdom of God. He himself being a servant is teaching us that that is of the greatest value. How is it possible that the church has gotten this so backwards? How is it possible that we have missed this so completely? And we have adopted success and greatness from the pagan culture around us when Jesus says, if you really want to be great, if you want to be Christ-like, if you want to be worthy of the term Christian, then be a servant. That's a great place for us to start in our own sanctification. Well, it goes on. Let's, let's take a look at some of these because there are some words here that I think that we need to define. Words like faithful and wise and manager in this. When he says, who then among you is the faithful and wise manager? And this is important that we define this because just after this, again, we're not going to do it today, but just after this, we're going to have the exact opposite kind of a servant who is just as active and just as, as, as visual on the outside. I, I, I mean, right now, I'm thinking of, of a, of a person who is one of the most heretical of all the teachers that are out there today, making hundreds of millions of dollars, tens of thousands of followers, huge churches, huge following, uh, and, and, and he is out there saying that he loves Jesus. He's out there saying that God speaks directly to, the, to him. He's out there saying, I, I, I have this direct connection, and if you want to follow Jesus, you need to follow me. Okay? He puts himself forward as a servant, just as you and I do. However, there is a vast difference between the two. It's not what's on the outside, it's what's on the inside, and that's exactly where Jesus is going to drive with this understanding of what a servant means. So that's why these words are important. First of all, the word faithful. Now, we tend to think that someone is faithful when they have a good attendance record. Like, for instance, a guy who gets a gold watch after being 40 years at the same job and being so faithful, he's almost not missed a day. Well, that's not what this word means because that man might have shown up for 40 years and slept all day and got no work done and the world would call him faithful when he really isn't within the church. And we have had people in, the, in this church like this. They don't, they don't tend to stick around too long, but they come every Sunday. I mean, you can see, you can rest assured that they're going to be here. They would be very upset at me right now because they would have a seat back in the part that is roped off and they would be upset that they couldn't sit there. So they probably move the robes to sit there. If you were sitting in their seat, they would tell you to get up because that is their seat. They're faithfully here every single Sunday. They act like they listen to the message. They have pleasant things to say to the pastor on the way outside the door, and then they disappear until the next Sunday, and you won't see them. You won't see them at a fellowship. You won't see them at uh, uh, any of the Bible studies. You won't see them in any of the ministry that we do, and you won't see them when you tally up who's been giving, but they are faithful in the eyes of the world because they come and they sit in a pew every single Sunday. That is not what this word means. This word means trustworthy. I like to read to you out of the Greek dictionary when I can. This is what it means. Pertaining to being worthy of trust. 
In other words, to be worthy of the trust that your master puts in you. That's what faithful means. That you have a task that the, the, the Lord has given you or your master in the, as far as the parable is concerned gives you a task. And you are faithful if you are busy about that task. If, if, if you make sure that it's done and, and, and you do it well and you don't have to be uh, watched over all the time to make sure that you're going to do it. it that's, that's the idea of faithful that is here to be trustworthy, to be reliable, to be dependable, to, to, for the master to know that he can leave you in charge. Some of you have children that you can say, clean your room. And you can trust them because you know they will do it because they are faithful children. You have, some of you have children who will not clean their room. They will tell you, I'll clean my room. You'll leave and you'll go in. It'll be totally messy. And that means they're not faithful Although, if they make a stab at it, they might be called faithful by the world. But that is the importance of that word. It means trustworthy, trustworthy to a task that your master gives you. The next word is wise. And the word wise in Greek is pretty close to what it means in English. It it's, goes beyond knowledge. It goes beyond facts. It goes beyond the intellect. You can be the most brilliant person in the world and not very wise. But wisdom in the Bible has a particular slant to it. And wisdom in the Bible is the wisdom from above. It is God's wisdom. Now, there are plenty of wise people in a secular sense. Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, the wise men from probably Persia. These were all wise men in the, in the eyes of the world. But in the biblical context, they are only wise to the degree that their wisdom reflects the real true wisdom. And that real true wisdom only comes from God. James puts it this way in his book. But the wisdom from above is first pure and then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And we should probably back up just a wee bit and tell you what James says about the other kind of wisdom. The wisdom that is from this world, it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. In other words, it is satanic in origin, and we know that Satan is a great deceiver, and he can make people wise with a wisdom that can fool you because it looks so much like the wisdom of the, of the kingdom, but it really isn't. So a wise and a faithful servant. Now, if you put those two words together, you've got something else. You've got another idea because it is wise to be faithful to 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 the, the very epitome of wisdom is to know what God's will for you is and then to spend the rest of your life doing that that's true wisdom let me let, let, let me give that to you as a parable I think it is just I mean as a principle it is just that important to know what the Lord's will for you is and then to spend your life doing it is the epitome of wisdom. It is biblical wisdom. So the, the, wise, the, the wise and faithful manager is what Jesus is talking about. That word manager, we've already run across it in that little parable within a parable. Remember we talked about the householder? There was a householder that was going to knows that a thief is going to break in and try to steal his goods. And we talked about it at the time. That's not curios. That's not the word of a master sort of mistranslated by the ESV. That rather it's a house owner. It's a householder. Well, here, the idea of being a manager, the same word is used, householder. But there's a very important distinction. And that is that this householder, as we will find in just a moment, is not a hired manager. He's not a hired servant. He's a slave. And he is owned by the master. That is the relationship and that is the context. This manager owns nothing, nor will he ever own anything. But he is still called to be a steward of his master's goods. That is the kind of servant that Jesus is talking about here. Um, 
Now, we, then, then he goes on in the 43rd verse. I'm sorry, he goes on and talks about the way that, that the, the fruits of that faithful wisdom. Let's continue that. And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household? Notice that the particular manager that we're talking about right now is in charge of the master's house. Imagine a very wealthy landowner. Imagine that he has a very large house and that he has many servants in that house. And there's a manager, there's a head butler, there is this, this, this chief slave among all of his servants. This is the one who is given the responsibility of, of, uh, of management, of the oversight of all the rest of them. But notice that this goes beyond just the business of the house. If you're overseeing any kind of facility like this one, or, or your own home, uh, there's a management that's involved. You're involved with the finances of it. You pay the bills. You're concerned about the maintenance of it and the improvements of it. There's all kinds of, and if there's any business going on, you would be involved with the business. But that is not the focus that Jesus is going to have because notice what he says about this particular manager. He says that, um, that he will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time. Notice that he's not talking about the house itself, even though that is included. What Jesus is interested in in this parable are the other servants, the other slaves. Okay, so this particular servant is manager over the rest of the servants. And he is a good and faithful and wise manager if he is giving each one of those servants their portion of food at the proper time. Now, there's two things involved with that. The portion of food, when you talk about something like that, you're not just talking about food. It's everything they need for a living. Food, water, and shelter, and clothes, and direction, and, and all of that. Remembering that these are all servants. These are all slaves. So this is a manager of men, if you will. Men and women uh, to, to, to be in charge of their lives. So there's this idea there of, uh, of shepherding, uh, of oversight, not just of a place, but of a people. Now, notice he says, Jesus says, to give them their portion. The New American Standard says ration. To give them what is theirs or what should be theirs. Now, that's an idea of fairness. That's an idea of equity. It's an idea that, unlike the wicked servant that we're going to see next week, that he is... He is passing out the food and the things not in such a way that he gains control over the other servants. That they are beholden to him or else he is going to cut their rations. I was in Haiti many, many years ago. This was very near uh, the, the time I started going. And, and I was the journalist at that time. And we were on a trip in the northern part of Haiti in a town called Fort Liberty. And um, we were uh, talking with a pastor there who had a prison ministry. And so we went into one of the prisons there in Fort Liberty to interview some of the inmates and to interview um, uh, the, the warden of the prison. There were two cell blocks with men in this prison only on both sides of it. And if you've ever been in a Haitian prison, you will realize that that is not some place you want to end up. Um, it, it was a horrible place. Uh, I, I'm going to say 10 to 12 men per cage, and that's what it was. It, it wasn't a, a room. It was just a barred cage with no facilities whatsoever. But um, when we went there, the warden, the first thing the warden said, he had two different cell blocks, okay? Now, this particular cell block was all Christian. It was the, the fruit of the pastor's labor, of his outreach into this, into this prison. And over here were the non-believers. And, and the warden took us out and he said, I don't know what you did to these guys, but whatever you did to them, do it to them. 
because these guys are perfect inmates. They never cause me any trouble. They sit around all day reading the Bibles that you gave them and singing songs. And these guys are nothing but trouble. So whatever you did to them, do it to them. And of course we said, it's not that easy. We, <laughs> we can't make it happen, but we'll certainly try as best we can. But nonetheless, the reason I'm telling the story was this. This particular warden was so proud of the fact that when a prisoner came to his facility... First thing he did was weigh him, and he had a spreadsheet on each, not, well, you know, a hand sheet, uh, on each prisoner. And every month, he would weigh that prisoner. And if the prisoner either stayed the same weight or gained weight, he would cut back his rations. Because he would proudly say, no prisoner comes to my jail and gains weight, right? So he kept them. He, was, he, he wasn't active. Excuse me, he wasn't equitable with the way that he distributed food to these prisoners. He did it with, a, with, with a, a, a purpose in mind. That is not the kind of manager that Jesus is talking about here. This is a servant who is equitable, who is not going to use his position to try and lord it over the others who are there. And, and, and then we learn that he, that he did it according to the proper time which means responsibility, which means oversight, which means that I'm not just going to open the food pantry and let these guys go in there and eat themselves sick. No, it's, I know what's good for them. I know what's best for the job that they do. And so therefore, I'm going to manage them with their best interest in mind. And, 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 and so just to back up from that and to try to, to figure out, well, well, what is Jesus saying there? Well, what he's saying, folks, is, is that a good manager is a servant. That the other servants are the servants of the master. And the master is just as concerned in those servants as he is the manager. And if the manager servant is the leader in the church, if you want to put it that way, the leader in, that, in whatever organization it is, if the leader is truly tuned into the master and wants to be Christ-like as the master, then he's going to recognize that the master loves the servants that he has been placed over and that his responsibility is to them. The model we have is, once again, of servanthood. That's greatness in the kingdom of God, folks. Greatness is not the first one in line. It's not the most successful. It's not the one with the biggest church. It's not the one. All of the ways that we gauge success in, in, in our world, it's, it's the one at the, at, at the back of the line. It's the one at the back of the room. It's the one who is watching after the ones that Jesus loves to be his servant and to be a servant to those that he came. And he talks about that kind of servant is going to be blessed Look at verse 43. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. That word blessed. That word blessed, you should be aware of that now. It's that old friend of ours, Makarios. And those of you who know what that word means, uh, you ought to be paying attention to it now. Makarios means not just to be blessed or get a reward. It means to be in a state of blessedness. In other words, the good servant is going to be a good servant not so that he can gain a reward. The reward is not the goal of his service. The reward is the byproduct of his nature. He's blessed. He's blessed by God. He's blessed to understand these things. And the outreach or the byproduct of that blessedness is going to be the kind of behavior that we are seeing in not only this good servant, but the one that we saw in the parable that came before it. So blessed is this um, um, uh, of, of servant. And it, what it does also, it precludes, it precludes the pursuit of a reward as the reason for being the kind of servant that our Lord wants us to be. We don't do it for that reason. We do it because we love the master and we know the master loves those that we've been placed over or with. And so therefore we serve them just as he would if he were here. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing. So we're right back in the second coming. We're right back in when Jesus returns and finds you. What will you be doing when he comes? And that is New Testament eschatology 
in a nutshell. He's going to return. You don't know when it is. The hour and the day is absolutely unknown to you. It is going to catch you off guard. That's the only thing that we know. It is going to be at a time that you least expect it. And the question is, what will ye find you so doing? Will you be this kind of servant or will you be more like the other one? Because when he comes, it's not as a humble servant. It is as king of kings and Lord of lords. Blessed is the servant whom his masters. Let's just stop. Let me put this in its perspective, folks. And I know that this is, um, this is something that is hard in the West especially. But we need to see this the way it is written. The word for servant is the word doulos. And doulos translated literally means slave. You almost come, always find it in scripture and our translations in English translated as servant or at best bond servant. But literally it means slave. And the relationship that we have here in this parable is between a slave owner and a slave. And we need to remember that. Um, it, it goes against our sensitivities because uh, of, in the West we find slavery abhorrent, and we should. The fact that slavery is a reality in Scripture does not make it right. It, it is a, a, a byproduct of fallenness and wickedness and evil for one human being to think that they can own and rob the self-determination of another human being. But in Jesus' day, it was the reality. And so he uses the relationship so that you understand that this is a parable. And in the parable, it is between a slave owner and a slave. And hopefully that can put your relationship with Jesus in its proper perspective. Because you are not your own, my friend. You were bought. And you were bought with a price. And that price is the blood of Jesus. He is your master. You are his slave. Now, you may want to call yourself a bondservant, a slave that has freely accepted Christ. Well, you never would have accepted him if he hadn't changed your heart first. So therefore, if we are going to understand this relationship, we need to understand that the, the slave owns nothing. It all belongs to the master. And that the master has given the keys to his house to this slave. To this slave. Just like he has given the keys to the kingdom of heaven to us. He has given us the keys. Now, if we don't keep in mind that we are slaves and he is the master and it all belongs to him, you start having problems. Because you start seeing on one side what Roman Catholicism has done. The keys actually are the Pope's to do with as he wants to. That's not what Jesus said. And in the Protestant sense on the, uh, sense, on the far other side, the New Apostolic Reformation, we're going to use the weapons of the, of the culture to take the culture back for Christ. We don't need the weapons of the culture. We have the gospel. That's all the weapon we need. And it's the most powerful weapon we have. But if we start for thinking that, okay, we're the ones that are in charge. We're the ones that have the keys to the kingdom. And we forget that we're the slaves and he's the master. We start thinking that he's never going to come back again. And we're going to be right into the same situation that the wicked servant was. So those are hugely significant, important of, uh, of things about this. It goes on. Blessed is the servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. He will come. That's not a question. And then he goes on and he talks about the blessing. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. Most of you are familiar with that truth formula. When we pray, we say, in Jesus' name, amen. Basically what we're saying is, in Jesus' name, truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We have seen his glory, the glory is of, of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the amen, the amen. And so we put it at the end of our prayers to say that this is truth. Well, Jesus would put it at the beginning of his statements when he said, amen, I say to you. And when he said that, and you know, for the most part, you know this, what he's doing is underlying it. He's saying this is a very important statement that I'm about to make. So perk up and listen to it. But as we discussed a couple of weeks ago, it's particularly important in Luke 
Because Luke only uses this phrase seven times in his gospel and in the book of Acts. And he's got more space in the New Testament than any other writer. And he only uses this phrase seven times twice in this chapter, twice in this discussion of what it means to be a servant. And both of them have to do with the incredible blessing that comes from those who are servants, true servants to the Lord. If you remember back in the 37th verse a couple of weeks ago, we read, Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. What an extraordinary revelation that is. Not only about Jesus, but about what he expects from us. That, that, that he would put before it, truly I say to you. Well, here he does the same thing. So this is important, brothers and sisters. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. Now, there is a fact, then that is that there is reward that Jesus does. We, we may not seek that reward. We're not 100% sure what that reward is. We don't know what kingdom treasure looks like. I've got a good idea of what it is. It's, it's not anything that's mine or yours. It's his. And, and it's the glory of God that is the kingdom treasure. But nonetheless, there is reward, just like we are going to see later on next week, maybe, or the week after that. There are levels of punishment in hell for those who are in different states. There are different levels in heaven. How that works out, I cannot tell you. But there's two ways for us to look at this reward. Well, actually, three ways. Let's look at it as the parable states it. What is Jesus saying as far as the parable is concerned? The master comes back. He finds the the slave that is manager over his household, to be faithful, to be trustworthy, to be wise, to be looking after his other servants. Everybody's happy and well-fed and clothed and busy doing the work that they're supposed to do. Okay, so what does he say? I'm going to put you over all my possessions. All right, that's, that's what happened. I'm going to give you a promotion. I've got a huge estate, and there's, there's barley, and there's corn, and there's wheat, and there's camels, and donkeys, and horses, and goats, and sheep, and there's all this commerce going on. I'm going to put you over all of it because you've been so faithful in this one thing. That is kind of what we think of when we think about the eschatological nature of the blessing that God gives us. Uh, Jesus goes over and over this. This is not a unique statement. One of the great parables, and it's at the end of Matthew, it's also in, in, in the other Gospels, is, is the, 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 the parable of the talents or, or the minus, where he gives three different servants different amounts of money, and two of them uh, are, are, are faithful, and they invest it. The other one buries it in the sand. You know the way it turns out. But this is what Jesus says to the faithful servants. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. How does that look in the hereafter? How does it look for Jesus to give all his possessions? Say, say that he comes back and he finds me being faithful. And he comes back and he finds you being faithful. Well, he can't give you all of his possessions and give me all of his possessions at the same time. So what, what, what does he mean? What, in what context is he talking there? Well, I, I, once again, I think it has everything to do with God. I think it has everything to do with his glory. I think it has everything to do with not us, not yours, not mine, but his. And, and, and that's the way that I see it. In fact, Paul goes on to talk about this amazing situation that we will find when we are made heirs of the kingdom. In Romans, he said, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. He told the Corinthians, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Now again, I can't tell you what this looks like eschatologically. I can't tell you how one of us can be rewarded more than the other, and there not to be a distinction between us. I, I just don't know how this works. 
I, as I've said before, I tend to think it's all about God and not about us. And there's not going to be any treasure trove that I have or treasure trove that you have. It's all going to be his. And we have the glory. We have the privilege of glorifying God in the way that we live while we are here on this earth. But what about the here and now? What does this mean? Now, here we're going to get down to the nitty-gritty here. What does this mean to a servant in this world now? Is there any application to this? When Jesus says this, truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. What does that mean, if anything, to us? Well, you know what the health and wealth people say. You know what the prosperity people say. They say he's going to give you money. He's going to give you wealth. He's going to give you influence. He's going to give you all the things that the pagans lust after. Really? I I, I don't see that. No, what he says is I'm going to give you All my possessions. What kind of possessions has he been talking about so far? People. Servants. Slaves. And he says, I'm going to put you over all of my possessions. I'm going to put you over more. Now, what happens? Follow me. What happens, those of you who are in leadership or have a job, what happens when you get a promotion? Say you're over one small group of people and then all of a sudden you're given a whole district, right? And let's just put it this way, there's no pay raise, okay? You're just given a, a, a whole lot more. I mean, this happens more than you would imagine. It, it, it's happened <laughs> pretty close to home, not, not with me, but with my daughters. Uh, you know, hey, listen, we, we want to give you a lot more responsibility But, you know, we're going to keep you on the same salary. So what comes with that? What comes when someone gives you all of his possessions? Responsibility, headaches, more fires to put out, sleepless nights, tiredness, stretched more than you can possibly imagine it. Okay, am am, am I hidden home with anyone? Anyone been there to where you have much more and you're just pulled, you're already pulled 10 different ways and you're given a, a reason to be pulled 20 different ways and then 50 different ways? When Jesus comes and he says, I'm going to make you master over much. I'm going to give you a lot more responsibility. It's like you've done really well at what you're doing. And now I'm going to give you more of what you've done well. Okay, to me, that's what this means in the here and now. And, and, and people who are really in the servanthood of, of being a servant to the Lord, you know this, don't you? Because the devil comes to you constantly and tries to discourage you and says you're just pulled too far. And you know something? Look at all these guys. Look at all these other people that are, that are getting ahead in life. They're doing all this, make, making double the money that I'm making, going on vacations when I don't take any vacations, having fun, and they have short hours. Look at all these things, and look at me, and I'm unknown. And nobody, I'm not talking about me now. I'm just using myself as an example. But, you know, we, we, the, the devil wants to, to disillusion us and, and to give us a sense of despair, like what our servanthood doesn't matter. But if you've learned anything, greatness in the kingdom of heaven is servanthood. It's exactly the opposite of what everybody else says it is. It's not the one who's first. It's not the one who is the greatest. It's not the one who has the most money. It's not the church that has the most people. It's those who are being servants. Peter says, is it us or is everybody? And Jesus says, I don't know. Which one of you is a servant? that's who I'm talking to. That's who I'm talking about. You know the way I see this? Please don't get me wrong. Don't think that I I think this has anything to do with numbers or size or wealth or position because those are pagan guidelines. It might be one person a year that God brings to to you or to someone else. If, If God gives you a gift of evangelism, let's just use that. And you have a heart for evangelism and you learn how to share the gospel and you're bold and you're insistent and and yeah, people will mock you and they make fun of you, but that doesn't matter because you're more concerned in the souls of the lost than you are on whether you look good and you become really good at it. It doesn't mean that you're going to save people that God is not saving first. What it means is that he might send more people your way. 
who need to hear the gospel because you're willing to share it at the drop of a hat and you know how to. Uh, what, what about a church? A little church like this one, okay? Now, if our focus is on missions and, and world missions, and we know that this is something that the Lord has called us to do, and if we set aside and say, okay, we are going to, we are going to pour ourselves into missions, well, we end up doing more, and I'm not bragging, I'm just stating a fact. We have done more in this little church in the mission field than churches ten times our size because the, God, because the Lord keeps bringing us missions opportunities. Yours might be hospitality. You might have a real gift that the Lord has given you and a heart for hospitality, for having fellowships and inviting people into your home and thinking about them on the holidays if they don't have anyone to celebrate it with. And this is your heart. And if you're really good at it, then guess what? God may send you other people who need that same kind of nurturing. That might be your gift is nurturing. You might be a discipler. And, and, and you're good at mentoring people. You might be a good teacher. There are many different things. We are a multifaceted body, many parts, many different tasks. What was the definition of faithful wisdom? It is to know the task that the Lord has given you and to do it for the rest of your life and to do it well. And if you do that, the Lord might just give you more to do. Doesn't mean he's going to make you... You know, what would happen in a little church like this? If all of a sudden, you know, people would have asked me all the time, how come we're such a little church? How come we have so many empty pews? Why don't we go out there and start uh, bringing people in? You know what would happen to us if this place all of a sudden one day was filled? We'd stop doing what we were doing that made them come here in the first place. Because there would be too many of them and we would have to go back and scratch. Listen, the Lord knows what he's doing. The Lord has called us to be servants. He, he not only called us to be servants, he showed us the way that it was. So let me leave you with this. Simple question. Who then is the faithful and wise servant? And I mean this. Who then is the faithful and wise servant? Is it you? Would you say this about yourself? If the Lord came back right now, would he find you faithful and wise? And would he find you a servant? Would he find you looking after those that he loves, that he died for? Would he find you giving of yourself in servanthood, stretched beyond what you possibly can, if he stretches you? Who among you are the faithful and wise servants? Is it you? And if it's not you, why not? If you're not the faithful servant that Jesus is talking about, why are you not? And then I think this is very appropriate for the first Sunday of 2024. What do you intend to do about it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's clear. You could not be clearer as to what constitutes greatness in your kingdom. It is not intellect. It is not wit. It is not charm. It is not charismatic speaking. It is, there are many things that are very important. The preaching and teaching of the words are important, but you keep going back to servanthood. And dear Lord, I think this is something that we have completely missed. That greatness in the kingdom of heaven is not who's the first, but who's the last. And who is the greatest servant and who's the one who is watching after your sheep. And the way that you would, if, if you would do yourself if you were here. Lord, make us servants. We sing that song. Make us servants. Make us your servants and make us servants to each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.